All right, welcome back to machine learning. Uh, I, um, I'm really excited to be able to share some amazing stuff that University of San Francisco students have built during the week, or written about during the week. Um, and quite a few of the things I'm going to show you have already spread around the internet quite a bit. Uh, lots of uh, tweets and posts and all kinds of stuff happening. Um, uh, one of the, the first to be widely shared was this one by uh, Tyler, uh, who did something really interesting. Um, he, he started out by saying, like, what if I like create this synthetic data set where the independent variables is like the X and the Y, and the dependent variable is like color, right? And interestingly, he showed me an earlier version of this where he wasn't using color. He was just like putting the actual numbers in here. And this thing kind of wasn't really working at all. And as soon as he started using color, it started working really well. And so I wanted to mention that one of the things that unfortunately we, we don't teach you um, at USF is uh, theory of human perception. Perhaps we should. Um, because actually when it comes to visualization, it's kind of the most important thing to know is what is the human eye or what is what is what is what's the human brain good at perceiving there's a whole area of academic study on this um, and one of the things that we're best at perceiving is differences in color right so uh, that's why as soon as we look at this picture of this synthetic data he created you can immediately see oh there's kind of four areas of you know lighter red color so what he did was he said okay what if we like tried to create a, a, a machine learning model of this synthetic data set um, so specifically he created a, a tree and the cool thing is that you can actually draw the tree right so after he created the tree he did this all in matplotlib matplotlib is very flexible right uh, he actually drew the tree boundaries um, uh, so that's already a pretty neat trick is to be actually able to draw the tree but then he did something even cleverer which is he said okay so what predictions does the tree make well it's the average of each of these areas, and so to do that, we can actually draw the average color, right? Which is actually kind of pretty. Um, uh, here is the predictions that the tree makes. Now, here's where it gets really interesting: is like you can, as you know, randomly generate trees through resampling, and so here are four trees generated through resampling. They're all like pretty similar, but a little bit different. And so now we can actually visualize bagging. And to visualize bagging, we literally take the average of the four pictures. Right? That's what bagging is. And there it is. Right? And so here is like the, the fuzzy decision boundaries of a random forest. Um, and I think this is kind of amazing, right? Because it, it's like a I, I wish I had this actually when I started teaching you all random forests because I, I could have skipped a couple of classes It's just like okay. That's what we do. You know we create the decision boundaries We average each area and then we we do it a few times and average all of them Okay, so that's what a random forest does and I think like this is just such a great example of um, Making the complex easy through through pictures um, so congrats to Tyler for that um, it actually turns out uh, that he has actually reinvented something that somebody else has already done. A guy called Christian Inney, who went on to be a, um, uh, one of the world's foremost machine learning researchers, actually <laughs> included almost exactly this technique in a book he wrote about decision forests. Uh, so it's actually kind of cool that Tyler ended up reinventing something that one of the world's foremost authorities on decision forests actually had has created so I thought that was neat that's nice because when we pop when we posted this on Twitter you know got a lot of attention and finally somebody was able, was able to say like oh you know what this this actually already exists uh, so Tyler's gone away and you know started reading that book um, something else which is super cool is uh, Jason Carpenter um, created a whole new library called um, Parfit uh, and Parfit is a, a parallelized fitting of multiple models for the purpose of um, selecting hyperparameters. And there's a lot I really like about this. Um, um, he's shown a clear example of how to use it, right? And like the API looks very similar to other grid search based approaches, but it uses the validation techniques that um, Rachel wrote about and that uh, we learned about a couple of weeks ago of using a good validation set. Um, 
and you know what he's done here is in his um, blog post that introduces it, you know, he's he's Gone right back and said like well, what are hyperparameters? Why do we have to train them? And he's kind of explained every step and then the the module itself is like it's it's very polished you know he's added documentation to it he's added a nice readme to it um, and it's kind of interesting when you actually look at the code you realize you know it, it's very simple you know which is it's definitely not a bad thing that's a good thing is to is to make things simple um, but by kind of writing this little bit of code and then packaging it up so nicely he's made it really easy for other people to to use this technique um, which is great and so One of the things I've been really thrilled to see is then uh, Vinay went along and combined two things from our class. One was to take Parfit, and then the other was to take the kind of accelerated SGD approach to classification uh, we turned, learned about uh, in the last lesson and combine the two to say like, okay, well let's now use Parfit to help us find the parameters of a SGD logistic regression. Um, so I think that's really a really great idea. Um, something else which I thought was terrific is um, Prince actually basically went through and summarized pretty much all the stuff we learned in the random and for random forest interpretation class. Um, and he went even further than that as he described each of the different approaches to random forest interpretation. He described how it's done. So here, for example, is feature importance through variable permutation. A uh, little picture of each one, and then super cool. Here is the code to implement it from scratch. Um, so I think this is like really nice post, you know, describing something that not many people understand and showing, you know, exactly how it works, both with pictures um, and with code that implements it from scratch. Um, so I think that's really. Really great. One of the things I really like here is that for like the um, tree interpreter part, he actually showed how you can take the tree interpreter output and feed it into the new waterfall chart package that um, Chris, our USF student, built to show how you can actually visualize uh, the contributions of the tree interpreter uh, in a waterfall chart. So again, kind of a nice combination of multiple pieces of technology we've both learned about and and built as a group. Um, I also really thought this um, kernel, there's been a few interesting kernels shared, and I'll share some more next week. Um, Devesh wrote this really nice kernel showing uh, there's this quite challenging Kaggle competition on detecting uh, icebergs uh, versus um, chips. And it's a kind of a weird two-channel satellite data, which is very hard to visualize. And he actually um, went through and basically described Kind of the formulas for how these like uh, radar scattering things actually work um, and then actually managed to come up with a code that allowed him to recreate you know the actual 3d um, uh, icebergs um, or ships and I have not seen that done before like I, I, I you know it's it's quite challenging to know how to visualize this data uh, and then he went on to show how to build a, a, a neural net to try to Interpret this uh, so that was pretty fantastic as well um, So yeah, congratulations uh, for, for all of you. I know for a lot of you, you know, you're um, Posting stuff out there to the rest of the world for the first time, you know, uh, and it's kind of intimidating You're used to writing stuff that you kind of hand into a teacher and they're the only ones who see it and You know, um, it's kind of scary the first time you do it, but then the first time somebody, you know, upvotes your Kaggle kernel or adds a clap to your Medium post, you suddenly realize, oh, I'm actually I've written something that people like. Uh, that's that's pretty great. Uh, so if you haven't tried yourself yet, uh, I again invite you to try writing something. And if you're not sure, you could write a summary of a lesson. You could write a summary of like. If there's something you found hard, like maybe you found it hard to fire up a GPU-based AWS instance, you eventually figured it out, you, know, you could write down, just describe how you solved that problem. Or if one of your classmates didn't understand something and you explained it to them, then you could like write down something saying like, oh, there's this concept that some people have trouble understanding, here's a good way I think of explaining it. Uh, there's all kinds of stuff you could, you could do. Um, okay, so. Let's go back to 
SGD. Um, and so uh, we're going back through this um, notebook which uh, Rachel put together, basically taking us through kind of SGD from scratch for the purpose of digit recognition. Um, and actually quite a lot of the stuff we look at today is uh, going to be uh, closely following a part of the computational linear algebra course, uh, which you can both find the MOOCs on FastAI or at USF, it'll be an elective next year. Right? So if you find some of this, um, this stuff interesting, and I hope you do, then please consider signing up for the elective uh, or checking out the video online. Um, so we're building um, neural networks, and we're starting with an assumption that we've downloaded the MNIST data, we've normalized it by subtracting the mean and divided by the standard deviation. Okay, so the data is um, it's slightly unusual in that although they represent images, they were they were downloaded as uh, each image was a 784 long rank one tensor, so it's been flattened out, okay? And so for the purpose of drawing pictures of it, we had to uh, uh, resize it to 28 by 28, um, but the actual data we've got is not 28 by 28, it's, a, it's, it's 784 long, flattened out. Um, okay, the basic steps we're going to take here is to start out with training the world's simplest neural network, It's basically a, a logistic regression, right? Uh, so no hidden layers, and we're going to train it using a library, FastAI, and we're going to build the network using a library, PyTorch, right? And then we're going to gradually get rid of all the libraries, right? So first of all, we'll get rid of <coughs> um, the NN neural net library in PyTorch and write that ourselves. <coughs> Then we'll get rid of the fastai fit function and write that ourselves and then we'll get rid of the PyTorch optimizer and write that ourselves and so by the end of um, uh, This notebook we'll have written all the pieces ourselves the only thing that we'll end up relying on is The two key things that PyTorch gives us which is a the ability to write Python code and have it run on the GPU and B the ability to write Python code and have it automatically differentiated for us. Okay, so they're the two things we're not going to attempt to write ourselves because it's boring and pointless, but everything else we'll try and write ourselves on top of those two things. Okay, so our starting point is like not doing anything ourselves, it's basically having it all done for us, and so PyTorch has an NN library, which is where the neural net stuff lives. You can create a multi-layer neural network by using the sequential function and then passing in a list of the layers that you want and we asked for a linear layer followed by a softmax layer and that defines our logistic regression okay um, the input to our linear layer is 28 by 28 uh, as we just discussed the output is 10 because we want a probability for each of the numbers not through nine for each of our images okay um, CUDA sticks it on the GPU and then fit fits a model okay so we start out with a random set of weights and then fit uses gradient descent to make it better um, we had to tell the fit function what criterion to use in other words what counts as better and we told it to use negative log likelihood we'll learn about that in the next lesson what that is exactly Um, we had to tell it what optimizer to use and we said please use optim.atom the details of that um, We won't cover in this course. We're, we're going to use something build something simpler called SGD um, If you're interested in Adam, we just covered that in the deep learning course um, And what metrics do you want to print out? We decided to print out accuracy. Okay, so uh, That was that um, and so if we do that Okay, so after we fit it we get an accuracy of generally somewhere around 91 92% So what we're going to do from here is we're going to gradually we're going to repeat this exact same thing. So we're going to rebuild this model 
you know, four or five times fitting it, building it and fitting it with less and less libraries. Okay, so the second thing that we did um, last time was to try to start to define the uh, the module ourselves, right? So instead of saying the network is a sequential bunch of these layers, um, let's not use that library at all and try and define it ourselves from scratch. Okay. So to do that, we have to use OO. Um, because that's how we build everything in PyTorch, and we have to create uh, a class which inherits from nn.module. So nn.module is a PyTorch class that takes our class and turns it into a neural network module, um, which basically means we'll, anything that you inherit from nn.module like this, you can pretty much insert into a neural network as a layer, or you can treat it as a neural network, it's going to get all the stuff that it needs automatically to, to, to work as a part of or a full neural network. And we'll talk about exactly what that means uh, today and in the next lesson. Right? Um, so we need to construct the object, so that means we need to define the constructor, thunder in it. And then importantly, this is a, a Python thing, is if you inherit from some other object, then you have to create the thing you inherit from first. So when you say super dot dunder in it, that says construct the nn dot module piece of that first, right? If you don't do that, then the, the nn dot module stuff never gets a chance to actually get constructed. Right? So this is just like a standard Python uh, OO subclass constructor. Okay. And if any of that's un, uh, unclear to you, then you know this is where you definitely want to just grab a, a Python intro to OO because this is uh, the, the standard approach. All right. So inside our constructor, we want to do the equivalent of nn.linear. All right. So what nn.linear is doing is it's taking our um, It's taking our 28 by 28 um, uh, vector, so 768 long vector, and we're going to be that's going to be the input to a matrix multiplication. So we now need to create a something with 768 rows and that's 768 and 10 columns. Okay, uh, so because the input to this is going to be a mini batch uh, of size, uh, actually let's move this into a new window. Seven sixty eight by ten, uh, and the input to this is going to be a mini batch of size sixty four by seven sixty eight. Right, so we're going to do this matrix product. Okay, so when we say in PyTorch nn dot linear, it's going to construct this matrix for us. Right, so since we're not using that, we're doing things from scratch. We need to make it ourselves. So to make it ourselves, we can say generate normal random numbers with this dimensionality. Which we passed in here 768 by 10. Okay, so that gives us our our randomly initialized matrix. Okay. Then we want to add on to this. Um, you know, we don't just want y equals ax. We want y equals ax plus b. Right. So we need to add on what we call in in, in neural nets a bias vector. So we create here a bias vector of length 10. Okay, again, randomly initialized, uh, and so now here are our two randomly initialized uh, weight tensors. So that's our constructor. Okay. Now we need to define forward. Why do we need to define forward? This is a PyTorch specific thing. What's going to happen is this uh, is is when you create a module in PyTorch, the object that you get back behaves as if it's a function. You can call it with parentheses, which we'll do it uh, that in a moment. And so you need to somehow define what happens when you call it as if it's a function. 
And the answer is PyTorch calls a method called forward. Okay, that's just that's the Python the PyTorch kind of approach that they picked, right? So when it calls forward, we need to do our actual calculation of the output of this module or layer. Okay, so here is the thing that actually gets calculated in our logistic regression. So basically, we take our um, input x, um, which gets passed to forward. That's basically how forward works. It gets passed the mini batch, and we matrix multiply it by the layer one weights, which we defined up here, and then we add on the layer one bias, which we defined up here. Okay, and actually nowadays we can define this a little bit more elegantly using the Python 3 matrix multiplication operator, which is the at sign. Okay, and when you when you use that, I think you kind of end up with something that looks closer to what the mathematical notation looked like, and so I find that nicer. Okay. Um, all right, so that's that's our linear layer um, in our logistic regression, in our zero hidden layer neural net. Um, so then the next thing we do to that is softmax. Okay, so we get the output of this matrix multiply. Okay, who wants to tell me what the dimensionality of my output of this matrix multiply is? Sorry? 64 by 10. Thank you, Karen. And I should mention, for those of you that weren't at deep learning class yesterday, um, we actually looked at a really cool uh, post from Karen who described how to do structured data analysis with neural nets, which has been like super popular. Uh, and a whole bunch of people have kind of said that they've read it and found it super interesting. So, uh, so that was really exciting. Um, so we get this matrix of, uh, of of outputs, and we put this through a softmax. And why do we put it through a softmax? We put it through a softmax because in the end, we want prob you know for every image, we want a probability that it's a zero or a one or a two or a three or four, right? So we want a bunch of Probabilities that add up to one and where each of those probabilities is between zero and one so a softmax Does exactly that for us So for example if we weren't picking out, you know numbers from 0 to 10 But instead we're picking out cat dog plane fish or building the output of that matrix multiply for one particular image might look like that uh, These are just some random numbers um, and to turn that into a softmax I first go e to the power of each of those numbers I sum up those e to the power ofs and then I take each of those e to the power ofs and divide it by the sum and that's softmax that's the definition of softmax so because it was e to the power of it means it's always positive because it was divided by the sum it means that it's always between 0 and 1 and it also means because it's divided by the sum that they always add up to one so by applying this softmax uh, activation function so anytime we have a, a, a layer of outputs which we call activations uh, and then we apply some function some nonlinear function to that that maps one um, one scalar to one scalar like softmax does we call that an activation function okay so the softmax activation function takes our outputs and turns it into something which behaves like a probability right we don't strictly speaking need it we could still try and train something which where the output directly is the probabilities right but by creating using this function that automatically makes them always behave like probabilities it means there's less for the network to learn so it's going to learn better Right? So generally speaking, whenever we design uh, an architecture, uh, we try to design it in a way where it's as easy as possible for it to create something of the form that we want. So that's why we use um, softmax. Right, so that's the basic steps, right? We have our input, which is a bunch of images, right, which is here, gets multiplied by a weight matrix. We actually also add on a bias right, uh, to get a output of the linear function. 
we put it through a nonlinear activation function, in this case softmax, and that gives us our probabilities. So there, there that all is. Um, PyTorch also tends to use the log of softmax for reasons that don't particularly need bother us now. It's basically a numerical stability convenience. Okay, so to make this the same as our version up here that uses log softmax, I'm going to use uh, log here as well. Okay, so um, we can now instantiate this class, that is, create an object of this class. So um, I have a question back for the probabilities where we were before. Mm -hmm. So um, if we were to have a photo with a cat and a dog together, would that change the way that that works, or does it work in the same basic Yeah, manner? so that's a great question. So if you had a photo with a cat and a dog together, and you wanted it to spit out both cat and dog, this would be a very poor choice. So softmax is specifically the activation function we use for categorical predictions where we only ever want to predict one of those things, right? And so part of the reason why is that as you can see because we're using e to the, right? e to the slightly bigger numbers creates much bigger numbers as a result of which we generally have just one or two things large and everything else is pretty small, right? So if I like recalculate these random numbers a few times you'll see like it tends to be a bunch of zeros and one or two high numbers, right? So it's really designed to try to kind of make it easy to predict like this one thing is the thing I want. Um, if you're doing multi-label prediction, so I want to find all the things in this image, rather than using softmax we would instead use sigmoid, right? So sigmoid would, call each of, would cause each of these between, to be between zero and one, but they would no longer add to one. Good question. And like a lot of these um, details about like best practices are things that we cover in the deep learning course, and we won't cover heaps of them here in the machine learning course. We're more interested in the mechanics, I guess. Um, uh, but we'll try and do them if they're quick. All right. So now that we've got that, we can instantiate an object of that class. And of course we want to copy it over to the GPU, so we can do computations over there. Um, again, we need an optimizer, we'll be talking about what this is shortly. But you'll see here, we've called a function on our class called parameters, but we never defined a method called parameters. And the reason that is going to work is because it actually was defined for us inside nn.module. And so nn.module actually automatically goes through the attributes we've created and finds anything that basically we we said this is a parameter so the way you say something is a parameter is you wrap it in and end up parameter so this is just the way that you tell PyTorch this is something that I want to optimize okay so when we created the weight matrix we just wrapped it with an end up parameter it, it's exactly the same as a regular PyTorch variable which we'll learn about shortly it's just a little flag to say hey you should you should optimize this And so when you call net2.parameters on our net2 object we created, it goes through everything that we created in the constructor, checks to see if any of them are of type parameter, and if so, it sets all of those as being things that we want to train with the optimizer. And we'll be implementing the optimizer from scratch later. Okay, so having done that, um, we can fit. Uh, and we should get basically the same answer as before, 91-ish. Um, so that looks good. All right. So what have we actually built here? Well, what we've actually built, as I said, is something that can behave like a regular function. Right? So I want to show you how we can actually call this as a function. So to be able to call it as a function, we need to be able to pass data to it. To be able to pass data to it, I'm going to need to grab a mini batch of MNIST images. Okay, so we used uh, uh, for convenience the um, image classifier data from arrays method from FastAI, uh, and what that does is it creates a PyTorch data loader for us. A PyTorch data loader is something that grabs a few images and sticks them into a mini batch and makes them available. And you can basically say, 
give me another mini batch, give me another mini batch, give me another mini batch. And so um, in Python, we call these things generators. Generators are things where you can basically say, I want another, I want another, I want another, right? Um, there's this kind of very close connection between iterators and generators. I'm not going to worry about the difference between them right now, um, but you'll see basically to turn um, uh, to, to actually get hold of something which we can say, please give me another of um, In order to grab something that we can we can use to generate mini batches We have to take our data loader and so you can ask for the training data loader from our model data object You'll see there's a bunch of different data loaders you can ask for you can ask for the test data loader the train data loader the validation loader uh, augmented images data loader and so forth. So we're going to grab the training data loader uh, That was created for us. This is a pi standard uh, PyTorch data loader. Well slightly optimized by us, but same idea um, And you can then say uh, this is a standard Python uh, Thing we can say turn that into an iterator turn that into something where we can grab another one at a time from and so once you've done that uh, We've now got something that we can iterate through you can use the standard Python Next function to grab one more thing from that generator. Okay um, So that's returning uh, an, the X's from our mini batch and the Y's from our mini batch um, the other way that you can use uh, Generators and iterators in Python is with a for loop. I could also have said like for you know X mini batch comma Y mini batch in data loader and then like do something Right, so when you do that, it's actually behind the scenes. It's basically syntactic sugar for calling next lots of times. Okay, so this is all standard Python stuff So that returns uh, A tensor of size 64 by 784 as we would expect right the, um, the the fast AI library we used defaults to a mini batch size of 64 That's why it's that long um, These are all of the background zero pixels, but they're not actually zero uh, in this case. Why aren't they zero? Yeah, they're normalized exactly right so we subtracted the mean divided by standard deviation, right? Um, uh, so there there it is so now what we want to do is we want to um, pass that into our um, our logistic regression so what we might do is we'll go Uh, variable XMB equals variable. Okay, I can take my X mini batch. I can move it onto the GPU because remember my Net to object is on the GPU. So our data for it also has to be on the GPU And then the second thing I do is I have to wrap it in variable. So what does variable do? This is how we get for free automatic differentiation um, PyTorch can automatically differentiate um, You know pretty much anything right any tensor um, But to do so takes memory and time So it's not going to always keep track like to, to, to do automatic differentiation It has to keep track of exactly how something was calculated. We added these things together. We multiplied it by that We then took the sign blah 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 right you have to know all of the steps because then to do the automatic differentiation it has to Take the derivative of each step using the chain rule multiply them all together Right? So that's slow and memory intensive. So we have to opt in to saying like okay this particular thing We're going to be taking the derivative of later. So please keep track of all of those operations for us And so the way we opt in is by wrapping a tensor in a variable, right? So That's how we do it and You'll see that it looks almost exactly like a tensor, but it now says variable containing this tensor Right? So in PyTorch a variable has exactly uh, identical API to a tensor or actually more specifically a superset of the API of a tensor Anything we can do to a tensor we can do to a variable um, But uh, it's going to keep track of exactly what we did so we can later on take the derivative Okay, so we can now pass that Into our Net to object and remember I said you can treat this as if it's a function Right, 
So notice we're not calling dot forward. We're just treating it as a function. And then remember we took the log, so to undo that I'm taking the exp, and that will give me my probabilities. Okay, so there's my probabilities. And it's got... returns something of size 64 by 10, so for each image in the mini-batch, we've got 10 probabilities. And you'll see, most probabilities are pretty close to zero, right? And a few of them are quite a bit bigger, which is exactly what we would hope, right? Is that it's like, okay, it's not a zero, it's not a one, it's not a two, it is a three, it's not a four, it's not a five, and so forth. So maybe this would be a bit easier to read if we just grab like the first three of them. Okay, so it's like 10 to the neg 3, 10 to the neg 8, 2, 5, 5, 4, okay, and then suddenly here's one which is 10 to the neg 1, right? Um, so you can kind of see what it's trying to, what it's trying to do here. Um, I mean, we, we could call like net 2 dot forward, and it'll do exactly the same thing, right? But that's not how all of the PyTorch mechanics actually work, it's actually, they actually call it as if it's a function. Right? And so this is actually a really important idea like, uh, Because it means that when we define our own architectures or whatever anywhere that you would put in a function You could put in a layer anywhere you put in a layer you can put in a neural net anywhere You put in a neural net you can put in a function because as far as PyTorch is concerned They're all just things that it's going to call Just like as if they're functions, so they're all like interchangeable and this is really important because that's how we create really good neural nets is by mixing and matching lots of pieces and putting them all together. Right? Let me give you an example. Here is my um, uh, logistic regression, which got 91 and a bit percent accuracy. I'm now going to turn it into a neural network with one hidden layer. Right? And the way I'm going to do that is I'm going to create one more layer. Uh, I'm going to change this so it spits out a hundred rather than ten, which means this one input is going to be a hundred rather than ten. Now this as it is can't possibly make things any better at all yet. Why is this definitely not going to be better than what I had before? Yeah, uh, can somebody pass the... Uh, because you've got a combination of two linear layers, which is just the same as one linear layer yeah. with different parameters. Exactly, right. So we've got two linear layers, which is just a linear layer. Right. So to make things interesting, I'm going to replace all of the negatives from the first layer with zeros, because that's a non-linear transformation. And so that non-linear transformation is called a rectified linear unit. Okay, so nn.sequential simply is going to call each of these layers in turn for each mini batch, right? So do a linear layer, replace all of the negatives with zero, do another linear layer, and do a softmax. This is now a neural network with one hidden layer. And so let's try training that instead. Okay, our accuracy is now gone up to 96%. Okay, so the, the, this is the idea is that the basic techniques we're learning in this lesson like become powerful at the point where you start stacking them together. Okay, uh, can somebody pass the green box there and then there? Yes, Daniel. Why did you pick a hundred? No reason. It was like easier to type an extra zero. <laughs> Like this question of like how many activations should I have in a neural network layer is kind of part of the, the the skill of a deep learning practitioner. We cover it in the deep learning course, not in this course. Um, when adding that additional, I guess, transformation, um, additional layer, additional layer. This one here is called a nonlinear okay. layer or an activation function. Are, the, you said activation layer. Activation function or activation layer. Okay, activation layer. function. Mm -hmm. um, does it matter that, like, if you would have done, for example, like two soft maxes, or is that something you cannot do? Like, when no, it... yo, you can absolutely use a soft max there, but it it's probably not going to give you what you want. And the reason why is that a soft max tends to push most of its activations to zero, 
Right? And an activation, just to be clear, like I've had a lot of questions in the deep learning course about like what's an activation? An activation is the value that is calculated in a layer, right? So this is an activation, right? It's not a weight. A weight is not an activation. It's the value that you calculate from a layer. So softmax will tend to make most of its activations pretty close to zero, and that's the opposite of what you want. You generally want your activations to be kind of as rich and diverse and, and used as possible. So nothing to stop you doing it, but it probably won't work very well. Um, basically, pretty much all of your layers will be followed by non uh, by uh, nonlinear activation functions that will nearly always be ReLU, okay. except for the last layer. To ask the question in a different way, uh, could you, when doing multiple layers, so let's say like going could you lift two or three, could you lift things? Just going two or three layers deep, mm -hmm. um, do you want to switch up these activation layers, no. or is it okay just to keep them? Consistent? No, that's a great question. So if I wanted to go deeper, I would just do that. Okay, that's a now two hidden layer network. So I think I heard you said that uh, there are a couple of different activation functions, like that rectified linear unit. Uh, what are some examples, and why would you use each? Yeah, great question. Um, so basically, like as you add like more linear layers, you've kind of got your input comes in, and you put it through a linear layer. And then a nonlinear layer, linear layer, nonlinear layer. Linear, uh, linear layer, and then the final nonlinear layer. Um, the final nonlinear layer, as we've discussed, you know, if it's a multi-category classification, but you only ever pick one of them, you would use softmax. Uh, if it's a binary classification or a multi label classification where you're predicting multiple things, you would use sigmoid. Um, if it's a regression, um, you would often have nothing at all, right? although we learned in last night's DL course where sometimes you can use sigmoid there as well. Um, so they're basically the, the, the options, main options for uh, the final layer. Um, for the um, hidden layers, you pretty much always use um, ReLU, right? Um, but there is a another um, another one you can pick, which is kind of interesting, which is called um, leaky ReLU, and it looks like this. And basically, if it's above zero, it's y equals x. And if it's below zero, it's like y equals 0.1x. Okay, so it's very similar to ReLU, but it's, it's you know rather than being equal to zero under x, it's it's like something close to that. Um, so they're the main two, ReLU and leaky ReLU. Um, there are various others, um, but they're kind of like things that just look very close to that. So for example, there's something called ELU, which is quite popular. Um, but like, you know, the details don't matter too much, honestly. Like that the like ELU is something that looks like this, but it's slightly more curvy in the middle. Um, um, and it's kind of like it's not generally something that you so much pick based on the data set. It's more like over time we just find better activation functions. So Two or three years ago, everybody used ReLU. You know, a year ago, pretty much everybody used leaky ReLU. Today, I guess probably most people are starting to move towards ELU. Um, but honestly, the, the choice of activation function doesn't matter terribly much, actually. Um, and you know, people have actually showed that you can use like uh, pretty arbitrary nonlinear activation functions, like even a sine wave, uh, and it still works. Okay. Um, So although what we're going to do today is showing how to create this network with no hidden layers, to turn it into that network, 
which is 96%-ish accurate, is, it will be trivial, right? And in fact, it's something you should probably try and do during the week, right? Is to create that version. Okay. So now that we've got something where we can take our network, pass in our variable, and get back some predictions, um, uh, that's basically all that happened when we called fit. So we're going to see how how that that approach can be used uh, to create this stochastic gradient descent. Um, one thing to note is that the to turn the uh, predicted probabilities into a predicted like which digit is it, we would need to use argmax. Um, unfortunately, PyTorch doesn't call it argmax. Uh, instead, PyTorch just calls it max. And max returns two things. Uh, it returns the actual max across this axis, so this is across the columns, right? And the second thing it returns is the index of that maximum, right? So, so the equivalent of argmax is to call max and then get the first indexed thing. Okay, so there's our predictions. Right? If this was in NumPy, we would instead use np.argmax. Okay. Um, all right, so here are the predictions from our hand-created logistic regression, and in this case looks like we got all but one correct. So um, the next thing we're going to try and get rid of in terms of using libraries is we'll try to avoid using the matrix multiplication operator, and instead we're going to try and write that by hand. Um, so this next part, we're going to learn about something which kind of seems, um, it kind of it's going to seem like a, a minor little kind of programming idea, but actually it's going to turn out that at least in my opinion, it's the most important programming concept that we'll teach in this course, and it's possibly the most important programming con uh, kind of concept in all of um, All of the things you need to build machine learning algorithms, and it's the idea of broadcasting um, And the idea I will show uh, by example um, If we create an array of 10 6 neg 4 and an array of 2 8 7 and then add the two together um, It adds each of the components of those two arrays in turn. We call that element wise So in other words, we didn't have to write a loop right back in the old days We would have to have looped through each one and added them and then concatenated them together We don't have to do that today. It happens for us automatically So in NumPy we automatically get element wise operations We can do the same thing with PyTorch. So in FastAI we just add a little capital T to turn something into a PyTorch tensor, right? And if we add those together, exactly the same thing, right? So element-wise operations are pretty standard in um, these kinds of libraries. It's interesting not just because we don't have to write the for loop, right? But it's actually much more interesting because of the performance things that are happening here The first is if we were doing a for loop right If we were doing a for loop that would happen in Python Right even when you use PyTorch it still does the for loop in Python it, it has no way of like optimizing a for loop and so a for loop in Python is something like 10,000 times slower than in C. So that's your first problem. I can't remember, it's like 1,000 or 10,000. The second problem then is that um, you don't just want it to be optimized in C, but you want C to take advantage of the thing that your all of your CPUs do, which is something called SIMD, Single Instruction Multiple Data, which is that your, your CPU is capable of taking eight things at a time right in a vector and adding them up to another 
vector with eight things in in a single CPU instruction Right, so if you can take advantage of SIMD you're immediately eight times faster It depends on how big the data type is it might be four might be eight um, The other thing that you've got in your computer is you've got multiple processes Multiple cores So you've probably got like if this is inside happening on one side one core you've probably got about four of those Okay, so if you're using SIMD, you're eight times faster. If you can use multiple cores, then you're 32 times faster. And then if you're doing that in C, you might be something like 32 times, thousand times faster, right? And so the nice thing is that when we do that, it's taking advantage of all of these things. Okay, better still, if you do it in PyTorch, and your data was created with dot coder to stick it on the GPU Then your GPU can do about 10,000 things at a time Right, so that'll be another hundred times faster than C Right, so this is critical To getting good performance is you have to learn how to write loopless code uh, by taking advantage of these element wise um, operations and like it's not it's a lot more than just plus I could also use less than Right, and that's going to return 0 1 1 or if we go back to numpy False true true um, And so you can kind of use this to do all kinds of things without looping so for example I could now multiply that by a and here are all of the values of a uh, as long as they're less than B Or we could take the mean This is the percentage of values in a that are less than B All Right so like there's a lot of stuff you can do with this this simple idea But to take it further right to take it further than just this element wise operation um, We're going to have to go the next step to something called broadcasting So let's take a five minute break come back at 217 and we'll talk about broadcasting Um, so Broadcasting This is the definition from the numpy documentation of Broadcasting and I'm going to come back to it in a moment rather than reading it now um, But let's start by looking at an example of broadcasting so a is a array With one dimension also known as a rank one tensor also known as a vector right? We can say a greater than zero so here we have a rank one tensor Right and a rank zero tensor Right a rank zero tensor is also called a scalar a Rank one tensor is also called a vector And we've got an operation between the two Right now you've probably done it a thousand times without even noticing that's kind of weird right that you've got these things of different Ranks and different sizes. So what is it actually doing? Right? Well, what it's actually doing is it's taking that scalar and copying it here 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 Right and then it's actually going element wise 10 is greater than zero 6 is greater than 0 minus 4 is greater than 0 even giving us back the three answers Right, and that's called broadcasting broadcasting means copying one or more axes of my tensor To allow it to be the same shape as the other tensor It doesn't really copy it though um, What it actually does Is it stores this kind of internal indicator that says pretend that this is a vector of three zeros? But it actually just like rather than kind of going to the next row or going to the next scalar it goes back to where it came from um, If you're interested in learning about this specifically, it's they set the stride on that axis to be zero That's a minor advanced concept for those who are curious 
Um, so we could do a plus one, right? It's going to broadcast the scalar one to be one, 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 and then do element-wise addition. We could do the same with the matrix, right? Here's our matrix. Two times the matrix is going to broadcast two to be two, 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 two and then do element-wise multiplication. All right? So that's our kind of most simple version of broadcasting. So here's a slightly more complex version of broadcasting. Here's an array called C, right? So this is a rank 1 tensor. And here's our matrix M from before, our rank 2 tensor. We can add M plus C. Right? So what's going on here? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. That's M, right? And then C, 10, 20, 30. You can see that what it's done is to add that to each row. Right? 11, 22, 33, 14, 25, 36. And so we can kind of figure it seems to have done the same kind of idea as broadcasting a scalar. It's like made copies of it. And then it treats those as if it's a rank 2 matrix. And now we can do element-wise addition. Does that make sense? No? Now that's... Uh, yes, can, can you pass that, Devon, over there? Thank you. So, as it's like, by looking at this example, it like copies it down uh, making new rows. Mm. Uh, so, how would we want to do it if we wanted to get new columns? I'm so glad you asked. <laughs> so, instead, we would do this. 10, 20, 30. Right? And then copy that. 10, 20, 30. 10, 20, 30. And now treat that as our matrix. So to get NumPy to do that, we need to not pass in a vector, but to pass in uh, a matrix with one column, right? a rank 2 tensor. So basically, it turns out that NumPy is going to think of a rank 1 tensor for these purposes as if it was a rank 2 tensor which represents a row, right? So in other words, that it is 1 by 3, right? So we want to create a tensor which is 3 by 1. There's a couple of ways to do that. One is to use np.expandims. And if you then pass in this argument, it says, please insert a length one axis here, please. So in our case, we want to turn it into a three by one. So if we said expand dim c comma one, uh, okay. So if we say expand dim c comma one, it changes the shape to three comma one. So if we look at what that looks like. That looks like a, a column. Okay, so if we now go that plus m, you can see it's doing exactly what we hoped it would do, right? Which is to add 10, 20, 30 to the column. 10, 20, 30 to the column. 10, 20, 30 to the column. Okay. Now, because the location of a unit axis turns out to be so important. Um, it's really helpful to kind of experiment with creating these extra unit axes um, and know how to do it easily. And np.expandims isn't, in my opinion, the easiest way to do this. The easiest way, <coughs> the easiest way is to index into the tensor with a special uh, index none. And what none does is it creates a new axis in that location of length 1. 
right? So this is going to add a new axis at the start of length 1. This is going to add a new axis at the end of length 1. Or why not do both? Right? So if you think about it like a tensor which has like three things in it could be of any rank you like, right? You can just add unit axes all over the place. And so that way we can kind of decide how we want our broadcasting to work. So there's a pretty convenient um, thing in NumPy called Broadcast2, and what that does is it takes our vector and broadcasts it to that shape and shows us what that would look like. Right? So if you're ever like unsure of what's going on in some broadcasting operation, you can say broadcast2, and so for example here we could say, like rather than 3,3, we could say m.shape, right? and see exactly what's happen going to happen, and so that's what's going to happen before we add it to m. Right? So if we said, turn it into a column, That's what that looks like. Make sense? Yeah. So that's kind of like the intuitive definition of broadcasting. And so now hopefully we can go back to that um, NumPy documentation and understand what it means, right? Broadcasting describes how NumPy is going to treat arrays of different shapes when we do some operation, right? The smaller array is broadcast across the larger array. By smaller array, they mean lower rank tensor, basically. Uh, broadcast across the, large, the higher rank tensor, so they have compatible shapes. It vectorizes array operations. So vectorizing generally means like using SIMD and stuff like that, so that multiple things happen at the same time. Um, all the looping occurs in C, um, but it doesn't actually make needless copies of data. It kind of just acts as if it had. Right? So there's our definition. Now in deep learning you very often deal with tensors of rank 4 or more, and you very often combine them with tensors of rank 1 or 2, and trying to just rely on intuition to do that correctly is nearly impossible, so you really need to know the rules. So here are the rules. Okay. Here's m dot shape. Here's c dot shape. So the rule are that we're going to compare the shapes of our two tensors element-wise. We're going to look at one at a time, and we're going to start at the end. Right. So look at the trailing dimensions, and then go towards the front. Okay. And so two dimensions are going to be compatible when one of these two things is true. Right. So let's check. Right. We've got our our m and c compatible. M is 3, 3, C is 3. Right? So we're going to start at the end, trailing dimensions first, and check. Are they compatible? They're compatible if the dimensions are equal. Okay, so these ones are equal, so they're compatible. Right. All right, let's go to the next one. Uh-oh, we're missing. Right? C is missing something. So what happens if something is missing is we insert a 1. Okay, that's the rule. Right? And so let's now check, are these compatible? One of them is one. Yes, they're compatible. Okay, So now you can see why it is that NumPy treats the one-dimensional array as if it is a rank 2 tensor, which is representing a row. It's because we're basically inserting a one at the front. Okay, So that's the rule. So for example, um, this is something that you very commonly have to do, which is you start with like an image of like 256 pixels by 256 pixels by three channels, and you want to subtract the mean of each channel, right? So you've got 256 by 256 by three, and you want to subtract something of length three, right? So yeah, you can do that absolutely because. 3 and 3 are compatible because they're the same, right? 256 and empty is compatible because it's going to insert a 1. 
256 and empty is compatible because it's going to insert a 1. Right? So you're going to end up with this is going to be broadcast over all of this axis, and then that whole thing will be broadcast over this axis, and so we'll end up with a 256 by 256 by 3 effective tensor here. Right? So interestingly, like very few people in the data science or machine learning communities understand broadcasting, and the vast majority of the time, for example, when I see people doing pre-processing for computer vision, like subtracting the mean, they always write loops over the channels, right? And I kind of think like it, it's it, it's like so handy to not have to do that, and it's often so much faster to not have to do that. So if you get good at broadcasting, you'll have this like super useful skill that very very few people have, and and like it's 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 an ancient skill, you know. It goes it goes all the way back to the days of APL. So APL was from the late 50s. Uh, stands for a programming language and uh, Kenneth Iverson wrote this paper called um, Notation as a tool for thought uh, in which he proposed a new math notation and He proposed that if we use this new math notation It gives us new tools for thought and allows us to think things we couldn't before and one of his ideas was broadcasting not as a computer programming tool, but as a piece of math notation. And so he ended up implementing this notation as a tool for thought as a programming language called APL. And his son has gone on to further develop that uh, into a piece of software called J, which is basically what you get when you put 60 years of very smart people working on this idea. Uh, and with this programming language you can express very complex mathematical ideas often just with a line of code or two um, And so I mean it's great that we have J But it's even greater that these ideas have found their ways into the languages We all use like in Python the NumPy and PyTorch libraries, right? These are not just little Kind of niche ideas. These are like fundamental ways to think about math and to do programming Like, let me give an example of like this kind of notation as a tool for thought. Um, let's let's look here. We've got C, right? Here we've got C none, right? Notice this is now a two square brackets, right? So this is kind of like a, a, a one row rank two tensor. Here it is the column So what is uh, uh, didn't mean to do some Round ones Okay, what's that going to do? Have a think about it Does anybody want to have a go? Can you even talk through your thinking? Okay, can we pass the uh, check just over there? Thank you. Kind of outer product? Yes, absolutely. So take us through your thinking. How's that going to work? Uh, so um, the diagonal elements can be directly visualized from the squares. Mm -hmm. 10 cross 10, 20 cross 20, and 30 cross 30. Mm -hmm. And if we multiply the first row, with this column, mm -hmm. we can get the first uh, row of the matrix. Mm -hmm. So finally, we'll get a three cross three matrix. Yeah. And so to think of this in terms of like those broadcasting rules, we're basically taking this column, right, which is of rank um, uh, three comma one, right, and this kind of row. Sorry, of dimension three comma one, and this row, which is of dimension. 1 comma 3 right and so to make these compatible with our broadcasting rules right this one here has to be duplicated three times because it needs to match this right 
Okay, and now this one's going to have to be duplicated three times to match this. Okay, and so now I've got two matrices to do an element-wise product of. And so, as you say, there is our outer product. Right? Now the interesting thing here is that suddenly now that this is not a special mathematical case, but just a, a, a specific version of the general idea of broadcasting, we can do like an outer plus, or we can do an outer greater than, right? Or or whatever, right? So it's suddenly we've kind of got this 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 concept that we can use to build new ideas, and then we can start to experiment with those new ideas. And so, you know, interestingly, NumPy actually um, uses this sometimes. Um, for example, if you want to create a grid. This is how NumPy does it, right? Actually, this is kind of the. Sorry, let me show you this way. If you want to create a grid, this is how NumPy does it. It actually returns zero, one, two, three, four, and zero, one, two, three, four. One is a column. One is a row. So we could say like, okay, that's x grid, comma y grid. And now you could do something like, um, well, I mean, we could obviously go like that, right? And so suddenly we've expanded that out, into a grid, right? Um, and so, yeah, it's kind of interesting how like, Some of these like simple little concepts kind of get built on and built on and built on. So if you lose something like APL or J, it's this whole environment of, of layers and layers and layers of this. We don't have such a deep environment in NumPy, but you know you can certainly see these ideas of like broadcasting uh, coming through uh, in in simple things like how do we create a grid in in NumPy. Um, so yeah, so that's. That's broadcasting, and so what we can do with this now is use this to implement matrix multiplication ourselves. Okay. Um, now, why would we want to do that? Well, obviously we don't, right? Matrix multiplication has already been handled um, perfectly nicely for us by our libraries, um, but very often you'll find in um, Uh, all kinds of areas in in machine learning um, and particularly in deep learning that there'll be particular types of linear Function that you want to do that aren't quite Done for you, right? So for example, there's like whole areas uh, called like tensor regression and tensor decomposition Um, which are really being developed a lot at the moment, and they're kind of talking about like how do we take like higher rank tensors and kind of turn them into combinations of rows, columns, and faces. And it turns out that when you can kind of do this, you can basically like deal with really high dimensional data structures with not much memory and not, with not much computation time. Uh, for example, there's a really terrific library um, called Tensorly. Um, which does a whole lot of this kind of stuff um, for you um, So it's a really really important area it covers like all of deep learning lots of modern machine learning in general And so even though you're not going to like define matrix multiplication you're very likely to want to define some other slightly different tensor product, you know um, So it's really useful to kind of understand how to do that so let's go back and look at our Um, matrix and our um, our 2d array and 1d array rank 2 tensor rank 1 tensor and Remember we can do a matrix multiplication Using the at sign or the old way np dot matmul. Okay, and so what that's actually doing when we do that is we're basically saying um, Okay, 
1 times 10 plus um, 2 times 20 plus 3 times 30 is 140. Right? And so we do that for each row, and uh, we can go through and do the same thing for the next one and for the next one to get our result. Right? Um, you could do that in Torch as well. Um, uh, we could make this a little shorter. Okay, same thing. Um, okay, uh, but that is not matrix multiplication. What's that? Sorry? Element wise, specifically we've got a matrix and a vector, so broadcasting. Okay, good. So we've got this is element wise with broadcasting. But notice. The numbers it's created, 10, 40, 90, are the exact three numbers that I needed to calculate when I did that first piece of my matrix multiplication. So in other words, if we sum this over the columns, which is axis equals 1, we get our matrix vector product. Okay? So we can kind of do this stuff without special help from our library. So now, let's expand this out to a matrix matrix product. So a matrix matrix product looks like this. This is this great site called matrixmultiplication.xyz, and it shows us this is what happens when we multiply two matrices. Okay, that's what matrix multiplication is, operationally speaking. So in other words, what we just did there was we first of all took the first column with the first row to get this one, and then we took the second column with the first row to get that one. All right, so we're basically doing the thing we just did, the matrix vector product, we're just doing it twice. Right? Once with this column, and once with this column, and then we concatenate the two together. Okay? So we can now go ahead and do that, like so. M times the first column dot sum, M times the second column dot sum. And so there are the two columns of our matrix multiplication. Okay? So I didn't want to like make our code too messy, so I'm not going to actually like use that, but like we have it there now if we want to, we don't need to use torch or numpy matrix multiplication anymore. We've got we've got our own that we can use using nothing but element-wise operations, broadcasting and sum. Okay. Um, so this is our logistic regression from scratch class. Again, I just copied it here. Uh, here is where we instantiate the object, copy it to the GPU, we create an optimizer, which we'll learn about in a moment, and we call fit. Okay. So the goal is to um, now repeat this without needing to call fit. So to do that, um, we're going to need a loop which grabs a mini batch of data at a time, and with each mini batch of data, we need to pass it to the optimizer and say, please try to come up with a slightly better set of predictions for this mini batch. Right? So as we learnt, in order to grab a mini batch of the training set at a time, we have to ask the model data object for the training data loader. We have to wrap it in iter iter to create an, an iterator or a generator, um, and so that gives us our our data loader. Okay, so PyTorch calls this a data loader. Um, we actually wrote our own fast AI data loader, but it's it's all, it's basically the same idea. Um, and so the next thing we do is we grab 
the x and the y tensor, the next one from our data loader, okay? wrap it in a variable to say I need to be able to take the derivative of the calculations using this, because if I can't take the derivative, then I can't get the gradients and I can't update the weights. Right? And I need to put it on the GPU because my module is on the GPU. And so we can now take that variable and pass it to the object that we instantiated, our logistic regression. Remember, our module, we can use it as if it's a function, because that's how PyTorch works. And that gives us a set of predictions, as we've saw seen before. Okay. So now we can check the loss, and the loss we defined as being a negative log likelihood loss object. Okay, and we're going to learn about how that's calculated um, in the next lesson. Um, for now, think of it just like root mean squared error, but for classification problems. So we can call that also just like a function. So you can kind of see there's this very general idea in PyTorch that you know kind of treat everything ideally like it's a function. So in this case, we have a loss, a negative log likelihood loss object. We treat it like a function. We pass in our predictions, and we pass in our actuals. Right? And again, the actuals need to be turned into a variable and put on the GPU because the loss is specifically the thing that we actually want to take the derivative of. Right? So that gives us our loss, and there it is, that's our loss, 2.43. Okay. So it's a variable, and because it's a variable, it knows how it was calculated. Right? It knows it was calculated with this loss function, it knows that the predictions were calculated with this uh, network, it knows that this network consisted of these operations. And so we can get the gradient automatically. Right? So to get the gradient, we call L dot backward. Remember, L is the thing that contains our loss. Right? So L dot backward is, is something which is added to anything that's a variable, you can call dot backward, and that says, please calculate the gradients. Okay? And so that calculates the gradients and stores them inside that, that um, uh, the, basically for each of the weights that was used, used, each of the parameters that was used to calculate that, uh, it's now stored uh, a dot grad. We'll, we'll see it later. It's basically stored the gradient. Right? So we can then call optimizer dot step, and we're going to do this step manually shortly, and that's the bit that says please make the weights a little bit better. Right? And so what optimizer.step is doing is it's saying like, okay, if you had like a really simple function, like this, right? then what the optimizer does is it says, okay, let's pick a random starting point, right? and let's calculate the value of the loss. Right? So here's our parameter. Here's our loss, right? Let's take the derivative, right? The derivative tells us which way is down, so it tells us we need to go that direction, okay? And we take a small step, and then we take the derivative again, and we take a small step. Derivative again, take a small step, derivative again, take a small step, until eventually we're taking such small steps that we stop. Okay, so that's what gradient descent does. Okay, um, how big a step is a small step? Well, we basically take the derivative here, so let's say derivative there is like 8, right? and we multiply it by a small number, like say 0.01, and that tells us what step size to take. This small number here is called the learning rate, and it's the most important hyperparameter to set. Right? If you pick too small a learning rate, then your steps down are going to be like tiny, and it's going to take you forever. Right? Too big a learning rate, and you'll jump too far. Right? And then you'll jump too far, and you'll diverge rather than converge. Okay? Um, we're not going to talk about how to pick a learning rate in this class, but in the deep learning class we actually show you a specific technique that very reliably picks a very good learning rate. Um, 
So that's basically what's happening, right? So we calculate the derivatives and we call the optimizer that does uh, a step, in other words, update the weights based on the uh, gradients and the learning rate. Uh, we should hopefully find that after doing that we have a better loss than we did before. So I just re-ran this and got a loss here of 4.16, and after one step it's now 4.03. Okay, so it worked the way we hoped it would based on this mini batch. It updated all of the weights in our network to be a little better than they were as a result of which our loss went down. Okay? So, let's turn that into a training loop. Right? We're going to go through a hundred steps, grab one more mini batch of data from the data loader, calculate our predictions from our network, calculate our loss from the predictions and the actuals. Every 10 goes, we'll print out the accuracy, just take the mean of the whether they're equal or not. Um, one PyTorch specific thing, you have to zero the gradients. Basically, you can have networks where like, you've got lots of different loss functions that you might want to add all of the gradients together, right? So you have to tell PyTorch like, when to set the gradients back to zero, right? So this just says, set all the gradients to zero, calculate the gradients, that's called backward, and then take one step of the optimizer, so update the weights using the gradients and the learning rate. And so once we run it, you can see the loss goes down, and the accuracy goes up. Okay, so um, that's the basic approach, and so um, next lesson we'll see what that does. All right. Uh, we'll, we'll look at it in detail. Um, we're not going to look inside here, as I say, we're going to basically take the calculation of the derivatives as as a given, right? But basically, um, what's happening there, in any kind of deep network, you have kind of like a function that's like, you know, a linear function, and then you pass the output of that into another function that might be like a ReLU, and you pass the output of that into another function That might be another linear net linear layer, and you pass that into another function that might be another ReLU, and so forth. Right? So like these these deep networks are just functions of functions of functions. So you could write them mathematically like that. Right? And so um, all backprop does is it says let's just simplify this down to the two version. Is we can say okay u equals f of x. Right, and so therefore the derivative of g of f of x is we can calculate with the chain rule as being g dash u f dash x. Right, and so you can see we can do the same thing for the functions of the functions of the functions. And so when you apply a function to a function of a function, you can take the derivative just by taking the product of the derivatives of each of those layers. Okay. And in neural networks, we call this backpropagation. Okay, so when you hear backpropagation, it just means use the chain rule to calculate the derivatives. And so when you see a neural network defined like here, right? Like if it's defined sequentially, literally all this means is apply this function to the input. Apply this function to that, apply this function to that, apply this function to that. Right? So this is just defining a composition of a function to a function to a function to a function. Okay? And so, um, yeah, so although we're not going to bother with calculating the gradients ourselves, you can now see why it can do it, right? As long as it has internally, you know, a, uh, it knows like what's the, what's the derivative of to the power of, what's the de derivative of sine, what's the derivative of plus, and so forth, then our Python code in here is just combining those things together, so it just needs to know how to compose them together with the chain rule, um, and away it goes. Okay? Uh, okay. So I think we can leave it there for now, and uh, yeah, and uh, uh, in the next class we'll go and we'll see how to write our own optimizer, and then we'll have uh, solved MNIST from scratch ourselves. See you then.